Good morning, everyone. Welcome to class. I know we're a little late this morning. Sorry about that. We're working on a couple of uh, things. I was trying to decide going back and forth about whether we should do this particular video that we're going to do this morning. We're going to only going to do a part of it. So it's only going to be, it's going to be less than 45 minutes long, but you're going to have to really uh, pay attention and keep up. Um, I'm just going to say a couple of the things they get into. There's just two or three things I'll clarify after it's over that, um, you know, I think they're getting off base on a little bit, but uh, we'll, we'll clarify that. But as for the, the general history of the Roman Catholic Church and the persecution, that as it formed in the, uh, as, you know, basically the early church began to get off in Rome and in that area. The Catholic Church officially didn't form until 313 A.D., but by uh, once Constantine was in power, but the, the backsliding, the falling away uh, had already begun before Constantine. Um, but we're going to go through now. Let me just go ahead and warn you, um, as it gets into the persecution that the Roman Catholics perpetrated on true Christians, Protestants, uh, it gets pretty graphic because uh, uh, it gets into the Inquisitions. And stuff. So what I'm going to say is some of you at home that are going to be watching this this morning, if you have your children running around, you might want to get them away from the screen in their room uh, playing because it's Roman Catholic. We have to show this because um, it says that she is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. So it's, it's vitally important that we just tell the whole truth about this. So this is kind of an overview. It's going to go from about, you know, just before 300 A.D., all the way up into the, the Middle Ages of the Roman Catholic Church. And then we will back up and talk about uh, how John prophesied it. So anyway, pay close attention. It's a good little video. Like I said, I think they're, they end up being Torah heads at the end of this. That's why we're not going to watch it all. But uh, the first part of it, the basic history, they did a pretty good job on it, apart from a couple of things. So anyway, let's watch this. This will give you an overview from about, you know, like I said, about 250 uh, A.D. up until we see the Catholic Church really uh, killing millions of people. So anyway, here we go. To make the best use of Christianity that had spread throughout the whole region of Rome, despite all sorts of persecution. This was because he thought that Christianity could solidify his empire. By approving Christianity as a national religion of Rome, Constantine tried to seek the unity of the Roman Empire under one religion. Thanks to Constantine's pro-Christian policies, many believers of the polytheistic religions of Rome streamed into the Christian Church. This tightened Constantine's political grip, and Christianity positioned itself as the religion of Rome, expunging persecution and contempt it had received so far. However, the indiscreet conversion they did without having any kind of understanding or faith, rather produced an adverse effect, the influx of pagan customs into the church. Those who were tainted with polytheism of Rome looked as if they had converted but in actuality, it wasn't easy for them to get rid of the religious rites and institutions of worshipping the sun, the moon, and the stars, and various gods and goddesses, which they had worshipped since their forefathers. The church in Rome sought for solutions to disburden the pagans when they converted to Christianity. It was to bring in things similar to the gods that the pagans had believed into the church. They thought they would increase the number of pagan converts by doing that. For the Christian bishops introduced 
with but slight alterations into the Christian worship, those rites and institutions by which formerly the Greeks and Romans and others had manifested their piety and reverence towards their imaginary deities, supposing that the people would more readily embrace Christianity if they perceived the rites handed down to them from their fathers, still existing unchanged among the Christians. The church in Rome that had been persecuted and despised wanted to put their roots down in Rome as an approved religion, even if they had to be mixed up with Roman polytheism. It was because they wanted to keep their faith in comfort being freed from the extreme pain of persecution. To attract more pagans, the church in Rome tried to Christianize various kinds of pagan gods to suit the Bible. One of the most representative things among them was accepting pagan customs of the sun god worship tradition. The church in Rome identified Jesus with the sun god. Inside of the church was decorated with various kinds of sun images and the idea to worship the sun was established as if it were the truth of the church. Judges, city people, and craftsmen shall rest on the venerable day of the sun. Constantine's edict in 321 played an important role in making the sun god worship faith to put its roots down in the church. Constantine continued to identify the sun with the Christian god in some way. When in 321, Constantine made the first day of the week a holiday. He called it the Venerable Day of the Sun, Sunday. The Christian Church took over many pagan ideas and images. From sun worship, for example, came the celebration of Christ's birth on the 25th of December, the birthday of the sun. As the sun god worship mingled in with Christianity, the church in Rome was deprived of its purity of the early church and changed its appearance to the Roman Catholic Church. Before the 3rd century, the church in Rome was one of many churches that were scattered all over the Roman Empire. The reason the church in Rome later became the head of all the churches of the world and dominated the Middle Ages was because it joined hands with Emperor Constantine. As a result of Constantine's pro-Christian policies, Many people who believed pagan gods converted to Christianity. This consolidated Constantine's political position. And there was no need for the church in Rome to refuse the converts because it was a good opportunity to secure its religious position.
after the church in Rome accepted pagan idolatry and doctrines. It was quickly secularized. During the Middle Ages, it was even hard to tell the difference between the church and the secular world. The Catholic Pope enthroned kings and kings protected the Catholic Church. Opposing the Catholic Church itself was rebelling against one's own country. The Pope wielded an absolute power. We can see just how powerful he was through one incident, the humiliation at Canossa. That happened during the time of Pope Gregory VII. Pope Gregory VII claimed that the Pope could not be judged by anyone on earth, and he could dethrone emperors and kings, and excommunicated Henry IV, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, in the course of the investiture controversy. As Henry IV was faced with the crisis of being dethroned, he went to the Pope who was in Canossa. Barefoot, he knelt for three days in the snow, outside the castle of the Pope, and begged for his forgiveness. This is what is called the Humiliation at Canossa Incident. The Pope had so much authority that there was no one who was able to hold back the Church from abusing its power anywhere in Europe. Not only that, the popes committed numerous crimes such as murder, blasphemy, simony, and adultery to hold on to their seat of power. We cannot even fathom the evil deeds of the corrupt popes. Among them, Pope Leo X enjoyed works of art and collected masterpieces. He invited artists like Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and Raphael to the Vatican and richly ornamented the church. Being driven by his vanity, he constructed St. Peter's Basilica. However, as he ran out of money by collecting costly works of art, he started to print a greater amount of indulgences. An indulgence is a certificate giving the forgiveness of sins. The Catholic priest propagated that people were guaranteed to enter the kingdom of heaven safer when they gave more money. Come, see for yourself. This is not just a simple indulgence. Even though you don't do confession, all your sins will be forgiven. Even the sins of your relatives in purgatory will vanish. Will you just leave your mother to suffer in the fire? Come here, everyone. Come. When you drop the coins in the box and it makes a clinking sound, then the souls will arise from the fiery purgatory.
the sale of indulgence was one of the biggest businesses of the Catholic Church. Since indulgences was a good solution for those who were seized by the fear of hell, numerous people gathered to buy the kingdom of heaven. Giotto, the representative artist during medieval Europe, clearly shows the evils of indulgence in his work. The Last Judgment. In the painting, Jesus, the judge, is in the middle and the apostles are on both sides. Heaven is shown on the right and hell is shown on the left. One thing that is worthy of notice here is the scene where souls are weighed. A man who is on his knees presents a model of the chapel to three women. The name of the man is Enrico Scorveni. He was a notorious loan shark of that time. Because loan sharking was a big sin, he could never dream of entering the kingdom of heaven. However, even though Enrico was a loan shark, he bought indulgences and paid for his sins and proudly purchased the ticket for the kingdom of heaven. The Bible teaches that only God can forgive sins. However, the Catholic Church insists that the Pope too has the authority to forgive sins. This kind of false teaching enabled them to commit fraud, the sale of indulgences. The Inquisition, run by the Catholic Church, is evidence that shows how corrupt and cruel the Catholic Church is. The Inquisition, which was established for religious trials, became a transnational institution of the Catholic Church. It was devised to condemn heretics designated by the Catholic Church. Heretics defined by the Catholic Church were the Christians who opposed the false insistence and doctrines of the Pope and wanted to live by the Bible. To rule over the world as they want, the Popes tried to get rid of the Bible and restricted people from reading it. Pope Alexander III labeled those who read the Bible as heretics and commanded to confine Christians who were condemned as heretics to expropriate their property. Pope Innocent III instituted the Inquisition and launched crusades to combat heresy. Numerous Christians were killed and dispossessed of their properties. Pope Gregory IX claimed to punish heretics who did not repent and appointed the order of St. Dominic as the Inquisitor. Pope Innocent IV promulgated the bull Ad Extripanda, explicitly authorizing torture and commanded to burn everyone who opposed Catholicism. Here is the salient religious trial of the century. Giordano Bruno, a medieval astronomer, was charged as a heretic by the Catholic Church and burned at the stake. The reason he was burned was that he denied the geocentric theory and insisted on the heliocentric theory.
after that, Galilee verified that the earth revolves around the sun. But he too was declared a heretic and was forced to recant his heliocentric view. Joan of Arc, maid of Orleans, who saved France from a crisis, was burned at the stake as a witch by the Inquisition. As years went by, the Inquisition helped the Pope exercise his extraterritoriality. To stay in power, the Catholic Church accused those who stood against them of being heretics and eliminated them. If a person was charged of being a heretic once, he had no right to have counsel. He was severely tortured and ended up being imprisoned for life or executed by fire. The Inquisition was the most infamous and devilish thing in human history. It was devised by the popes and used by them for 500 years to maintain their power. For its record, none of the subsequent lines of holy and infallible popes have ever apologized. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. Historians estimate that in the Middle Ages and early Reformation era, more than 50 million martyrs perished at the hands of the papacy. During the Dark Ages, 50 million innocent people were killed. In order to increase its wealth and power, the Catholic Church killed a great number of people. It is a distortion of history to call a murderer the Apostle of Peace. The Bible describes the crimes of the Catholic Church as below. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. He will speak against the Most High and oppress His saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to Him for a time, times, and half a time. The Roman Catholic Church was Babylon the Great that ruthlessly killed innocent people who followed Jesus. The crimes of the Roman Catholic Church, which are prophesied in the Bible, are clearly seen in history. In the Museum of Torture Instruments in San Marino in Europe, the torture devices which were used during the Dark Ages are displayed. Iron Maiden. It is one of the representative torture devices from the medieval period. It is an iron cabinet with a spiked covered interior with iron spikes about eight inches long. When a person is enclosed inside, the whole body is pierced with the pointed iron spikes and is fatally injured. And the person dies slowly from excessive bleeding. The torture device in the shape of a wheel was invented for execution. They tied a person around the wheel, then rolled it repeatedly over fire or spikes. They also bound the four limbs of a person on a wheel and crushed the bones using an iron bar or hammer. Then the person 
was thoroughly injured and died in pain, still bound to the wheel. The Inquisition invented cruel torture devices to give victims as much pain as possible. A torture device with sharp iron hooks to tear off a living person's skin. A pyramid-shaped torture device with a sharp tip. A person was put on top and suffered severe pain as a sharp point was inserted into the body, little by little, due to the body. Most of the time, torches were carried out by Catholic monks or priests. They pulled out nails using pliers, burned parts of the body with fire, and crushed fingers and toes with torture devices. A pulley was used to lift a victim's body and then drop them to make all the joints go out of place. A person was burned alive while their hands and feet were tied. A chair with spikes was used to tie a person down and it made blood come out from every part of their body. If a victim denied the Catholic Church's teachings, despite the heart torture, they poured boiling lead in the mouth or ears or gouged out their eyes or flogged them until parts of their skin flew off. Sword. Slaying by sword and burning the victims alive. The Catholic priest enforced them to follow their teachings, holding the cross in front of them. Persecution for anti-Catholics continued as a large-scale massacre. In 1209, 6,000 were slain to death at Berthiers. And 1211, 100,000 Christians were massacred at Lavore. Though the massacre at Merendal, 500 women were locked in a room and burned to death. In the massacre of Orange, in 1562, the Italian army sent by Pope Pius IV was commanded to slay men, women, and children. In 1572, approximately 100,000 people were massacred in Paris, France. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. As it was prophesied that the one who speaks against the Most High would make war against the saints and conquer them, over 50 million people were slaughtered during the Dark Ages. The cruel massacre of the Catholic Church during the Dark Ages continued to the Holocaust, which killed six million Jews, the most tragic event in human history. From 1933 to 1945, six million Jews, including 1.5 million children, were slaughtered in 15 European countries, such as Poland, Russia, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Romania, Yugoslavia, 
and Greece. All property of the Jews was confiscated. Women were dragged naked in public. They suffered from starvation, infectious diseases, confinement, and public execution. The Jews who survived face a miserable death in gas chambers in concentration camps built by the Nazis. When the gates of the concentration camps for the Jews were opened, as World War II ended, the world was shocked. In the concentration camps, there were dead bodies of the Jews that were not buried here, piled up like a mountain. While Hitler massacred six million Jews under the pretext of ethnic cleansing, the Catholic Church publicly advocated Hitler's genocide of the Jews, claiming it stood for anti-Semitism. When the Nazis' genocide of the Jews reached its peak, Weissmendel, a Jewish rabbi, sent a letter to the Vatican to ask for help. He begged the Pope to save the innocent Jews, especially young children. 1.5 million out of 6 million Jews who were slaughtered were children. His plea was a desperate outcry. However, the reply he received from the papacy was not just heartless, but blood currently. There is no such thing as the innocent blood of Jewish children. All Jewish blood is guilty. And the Jews must die. Because that is their punishment for that sin. The Catholic Church was always hostile to the Jews for the reason that they had killed Christ. And they committed countless murders under the pretext that they were punishing the Jews on behalf of God. This kind of attitude of the Catholic Church greatly affected Hitler, who was Catholic. Hitler was a fervent Catholic. The reason Hitler extremely hated the Jews was from the historical experience of the Catholic Church which had treated the true Christians and the Jews mercilessly for 1,600 years. For this reason, Hitler was able to commit the Holocaust, sending six million Jews to gas chambers without hesitation. Before the massacre of the Jews began, the Catholic Cardinals officiated in mass for blessing the German Nazi guards. And the Catholic Church publicly advertised Hitler's genocide of the Jews. The Catholic Church has committed crimes against humanities for centuries in the name of religion. They committed the crime of killing 50 million Christians 
and the Holocaust of killing six million Jews. The traces of the massacre of the Jews still remain at the Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland. The pictures of the Jews and their belongings are displayed in the concentration camp, showing how the Jews were mistreated, cursed, and insulted. These horrible times remain in the records of history. But all the errors of the Catholic Church are disappearing from people's memories, little by little. As the 21st century began, the Roman papacy admitted to all kinds of crimes they had committed against humanity for the past 2,000 years of Christian history. They admitted their faults, such as the Crusades, anti-Semitism, the Inquisition, and witch hunts. The Pope also said that the Catholic Church would like to create a new unity among religions by looking back on all their religious errors. However, can all the errors of the Catholic Church be forgiven by just admitting to all the crimes they committed against humanity in the past? Just by admitting to their errors, the Catholic Church's crimes cannot be solved. They can never come to true repentance unless they realize their fundamental errors. When viewed from historical facts and the prophecies of the Bible, the Catholic Church is an organization of the Antichrist, which has destroyed all the truths of God, paganized Christianity by accepting all kinds of pagan gods and made numerous souls worship Satan, not God. Not being content with their crime of killing cruelly whoever was against them for the past 2,000 years of Christian history, the Catholic Church is still committing a crime of driving countless souls to death. Therefore, admitting their crimes which have already been revealed through history without having fundamental repentance is only a crafty trick of the Catholic Church to pull the wool over people's eyes. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. In human history, the organization which has killed the most people is the Catholic Church. Nevertheless, the Pope is called an Apostle of Peace. It is an act to distort history. The reason the Catholic Church is more dangerous than any other organization is that they are doing all these things in the name of Christ. However, now the Catholic Church is revealing its detestable and hideous reality.
uh, in terms of uh, declining congregations, but more profoundly uh, to do with the paedophile uh, sex scandal that has rocked the church uh, for more than uh, 10 years. We've been looking into one particular case involving... Incredible. One of the, one, one former priest said that, you know, perhaps 50% of priests who enter the priesthood may be gay. I talked to a long... This is the living evidence which shows that Babylon the Great is falling apart, being judged by God's wrath as it has been prophesied in the Bible. Fallen. Fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is a Lord God who judges her. Okay, I know that was, uh, like I said, a bit graphic there, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that uh, they didn't even begin to cover it in detail, how bad. So when uh, John foretold this, it, it makes more sense now when we go back and we read this. Um, when Kevin's setting up my uh, PowerPoint right now, but you can go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 17. And of course, of course, I I cover this. Of course, you cannot cover church history without covering the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, that'd be like studying the Book of Acts and ignoring the gift of tongues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yet, a lot of preachers do, as you can see, about the whore of Babylon. I did this because in recent years, you know, really, I don't know. It's it's probably been in. It's probably been around for for longer than the last 20 or 30 years, but it really caught on in these last times, you know, these uh, these YouTube days, these internet days, that the United States is Mystery Babylon. But I'm, I'm just going to say, that is has to be one of the most ridiculous teachings I've ever heard, yet many people buy into it. You know why? Number one, they don't know history. They don't know church history. Number two, they don't know their Bibles very well, and they get their theology primary from, uh, primarily from YouTube videos instead of studying. And so, not wrong, there's good YouTube videos, there's bad ones. So if you don't know history by going back and looking at history, and if you don't know your Bible and you don't pay attention to details, then you'll listen to anything, just about. All right, but I'm going to tell you right now, there's no way, no how, that the United States is Mystery Babylon. If on one issue alone, the United States has only been around for, what is it, 240 years or so, we are not drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, and we're not guilty also, the Bible says, Mystery Babylon, that she is guilty of the blood of the original apostles. Now, there's only one city that can claim uh, the guilt of the blood of the original apostles, and that would be Rome. And let's just remember, people say, well, that was the Roman Empire. Yes, but remember, once Constantine declared Christianity the official religion and created his own church, the Roman Catholic Church, Rome just simply switched from military robes to religious robes, okay? It's the same, and it's the same city, and, and in fact, the, the late Roman emperors took the title of pontifex, which is the title the popes took. So uh, truly, the emperor of Rome continued on. They just called him a pope. We're going to talk about the whore of Babylon today, and we're going to look at this in a little detail. Of course, I believe that the whore of Babylon is the Roman Catholic Church without any question. Of course, the people that did that video, they believe that as well. Let me just go on to say that many of the reformers, many of our 
men of God down through the ages like John Wesley, uh, Huss, um, goodness. I mean, you could just go on down the line, Whitfield, many of the great reformers from uh, Luther, and, and you could just go on down, believe that Rome or the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, was Mystery Babylon spelled out in the scriptures in Revelation 17 and 18. So we're going to look at those details today because it is important that we identify, if, especially if we're not going to be deceived in the end times, we've got to uh, correctly identify the end times players that are in all of this. And listen, part of, you know, part of knowing church history is being able, like I have to be able to explain to a Jew who's been persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church and knows that the Jews have been persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church for centuries, I have to explain to a Jew, if I'm going to ever win them to Jesus Christ as the Messiah, that this church, this Roman Catholic counterfeit, has never been the real church of Jesus Christ, the real church of the Messiah. Um, this, is, this was Satan's way of turning a lot of people away from Christianity, create a counterfeit, a false version, have it do horrible things like murder millions of people, torture millions of people, force people to convert to their Catholicism. Uh, and now we're dealing with uh, the, the evidence and the clear case after case of the Roman Catholic Church is eaten up with uh, homosexuality, sexual immorality, particularly child molesting. So there's, there's never been, I'm just going to say, there's never, ever, ever been a Roman Catholic church that was not uh, corrupted from the inside out. I mean, just in, in, in every regard. In fact, if I don't have time this morning to go back and look at the popes, some of the early popes and the things that they were doing. Um, it's just, un, it's unbelievable uh, that, you know, this thing was able to happen. But you have to know, Satan was going to create his own version of the church, right? And But the, the neat thing about this is that the Apostle John, of course, the Apostle John foretold this in the book of Revelation, and we're going to look at that in a second. But I want you to see, we know that, that John wrote the book of Revelation in A.D. 95 to 96, right? So his disciple, John's disciple Polycarp, and his disciple Irenaeus talked about in their writings that the book of Revelation was written by the Apostle John in A.D. 95 and 96. So we have the historical record on it as well, because many people try to say because of the, because of the detailed prophecy of the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church has tried to you know, send out its little deceptions and lies and say that the book of Revelation was written much later than A.D. 95, and it wasn't even written by John. And There's all this disinformation and lies out there, but church history, the men of God, the true apostolic fathers and disciples of, of John uh, went on to say, Irenaeus says John's vision in Revelation was toward the end of Domitian's reign. That's the emperor, the Roman emperor Domitian, who reigned from... 81 AD to 96 AD, Irenaeus uh, lived in 120 to 202 AD. He was trained under Polycarp of Smyrna. Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John and the bishop of the Church of Smyrna in Asia Minor. According to Polycarp, the book of Revelation was written after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. In his epistle to the Philippians, Polycarp states that his church at Smyrna did not exist in the days of the Apostle Paul before the destruction of Jerusalem. So that's one testimony of history. Here's Irenaeus in his five books against heresies. History uh, tells us Revelation was written late in the first century and Irenaeus work entitled Against Heresies, chapter 13, verse 18. Irenaeus tells us when John had his apocalyptic vision and wrote the book for that referring to John's vision, Irenaeus wrote the following. We will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of the Antichrist, for if it were necessary that his name should be distinctly revealed in this present time, it would have been announced by him who beheld the apocalyptic vision, for that was seen not very long time since, but almost in our day towards the end of Domitian's reign. So two testimonies there of church fathers, church history, two generations actually. 
So let's look at Revelation 17, 1 through 5. Let's just read this together this morning. All right, Revelation 17, 1 through 5. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, I want to bring out something about this that I've never brought out. The word sitteth. Guess what Greek verb tense that is, students? <laughs> Present tense Greek verb, which means ongoing, continuous, and guess what? Taking place in the present, right? So when John, just the very verb he uses when he's talking about this great whore, she had to exist when he was writing this, okay? So the Roman Empire existed, the city of Rome, with all of their gods, false gods and heresies, uh, it existed then. And their persecution of the true church of Jesus Christ and true Christians was in existence at that time. All right. But remember, when Jesus is giving them, he's giving him this uh, and he gives the picture of how this great whore who existed right then would evolve the changes that would take place in her and what she would become. Right. So I wanted you to see that when he says the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, that was present tense Greek verb, which means ongoing continuous action taking place in the present when John wrote it. All right. And you're going to see that confirmed again by the end of the chapter. He goes on to say in verse two, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And remember, we've stated that fornication, the word pornia, pornia, can mean both all forms of sexual immorality and spiritual idolatry. You need to remember that. You can look it up in your Strong's Concordance if you don't believe me. Um, but it says here, the kings of the earth have committed fornication or idolatry, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her idolatry. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Now, and he said, and I, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication or her idolatry. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Uh, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which has seven heads and ten horns. Now we're not going to get into the talking about the seven heads and, and the ten horns this morning. But I want you to see, I want you to jump down there to verse 9. What does it say? And here is the mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So he's giving you a hint that this woman has seven mountains or seven hills. And uh, let's keep going here. We're going to skip down to Revelation 14. Because we're not going to get into talking about the beast that she rides this morning. We'll deal with that another time. But... It says here, talking about her and this beast and these, these ten kings with the ten horns, it says in verse 14, These shall make war with the Lamb, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. And He saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So we have this whore, right? Mystery Babylon the Great. She is full of idolatry, which meaning she's a religious system. The kings of the earth join her. She sits upon many waters, meaning that she has influence and control over peoples, tongues, multitudes, nations all over the world. So it's a worldwide institution, though it's a city. 
And then he says here, verse 16, And the ten horns which you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, they shall make her desolate and naked, and they shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. So he's talking about the future judgment in the last days of Mystery Babylon, I believe the, the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church. And then he gives you this final hint here in chapter 17. And the woman which you saw is that great city. Is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. <laughs> First of all, he says, that woman that you saw is that great city. Okay? That can't be America. America's not a city. We are a country. We have many cities. All right? He's talking about a great city. And notice he uses the is. He says, the woman which you saw is that great city. So is means it's presently in existence. The United States of America did not even exist in 95 AD. Okay? So he uses the term is. And we're not going to be like Bill Clinton. We know what the definition of is is. Right? Now, we keep going. What does he say here? Which reigneth over the kings of the earth. The present tense... Verb is used here, reigneth. Right. So he's saying the, the city, the woman you saw is the great city. She's presently with us here. She is presently reigning over the kings of the earth. Now, it couldn't be any other. We have the, the, the hint on seven hills. We have the hint of the woman that's reigning over the kings of the earth. But John writing in AD 95 says, this is presently, in this city's in existence. She's presently reigning over the kings of the earth. She's presently already full of idolatry and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. But he's talking about something that's, and, and if you see it, remember it says, reigneth and sitteth upon many waters, meaning her influence will continue until the words of God are fulfilled, meaning until it's all over with. All right? Does everybody see that in the Scriptures? It's not Pastor Dean making this up. We look at what the Scripture says. We look at what the verb tenses say. It's pretty clear. And then we look at history. All right? So let's look at some of these things here. The Roman Catholic apologist, and I have some of this in my book, The Polluted Church from Rome to Kansas City, this is actually a different quote from a different guy other than what I have, but there's multiple sources that tell us. But this is a Roman Catholic apologist. Carl Keating admits that Rome has long been known as Babylon. Keating claims that Peter's statement in 1 Peter 5.13, the church here in Babylon sends you her greeting, proves that Peter was writing from Rome. He explains further... Now, this is a Roman Catholic apologist admitting that Peter's reference to Babylon in 1 Peter 5 was referring to Rome. He said, Babylon is a code word for Rome. It is used that way six times in the last book of the Bible. Four of the six are in chapter 17 and 18 and in the extra biblical works of the sibling oracles and the apocalypse of Barak. Um, goes on to say, Eusebius, writing in 303, noted that it is said that Peter's first epistle, and notice that Eusebius wrote this before the Catholic Church was formed under Constantine, about 10 years before. And he wrote this saying that it is, uh, it's noted that it is said that Peter's first epistle was composed at Rome itself and that he himself indicates this, referring to the city figuratively as Babylon. So Peter referred to Babylon. The church fathers admit that Peter's reference to Babylon was Rome. And Roman Catholic apologists admit that Peter's references to Babylon is Rome. So pretty, uh, pretty good uh, sources there, wouldn't you say? Now let's keep going. Remember, it's mystery Babylon. So you, you read this right here. It says, and this is taken, for, by the way, this is taken from uh, Dave Hunt's book, A Woman Rides the Beast. It's an excellent book that he did many years ago. He says, as for mystery, that name imprinted on the woman's forehead is the perfect designation for Vatican City. Mystery is at the very heart of Roman Catholicism. From the words mysterium, fide, pronounced uh, at the alleged transformation of the bread and wine into the literal body and blood of Christ to the 
enigmatic apparitions of Mary around the world. Every sacrament from baptism to extreme unction manifests the mysterious power which the faithful must believe the priest willed, but from which there is no visible evidence. Rome's new catechism explains that liturgy aims to initiate souls into the mystery of Christ. So it's all about mystery, mystery, mystery to them. So we have referenced them, them as mysteries. They love the mysteries. It's mystery of how we change the real bread into the real flesh of Jesus. That's a mystery because it doesn't happen, right? You just got to have an imagination, all right? So here we go. So we've connected two things, mystery and Babylon, to the Roman Catholic Church. Now it's, it's called the city on seven hills right here, Revelation 17, 9 again. And here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sit it. There's, of course, this guy says there's more than one interpretation for this text. But literally speaking, Rome is known as the city of seven hills. The Vatican sits on one side of the Tiber River facing seven hills. So that's a pretty well-known fact in the world. But somebody say, well, there's other cities that have seven mountains or seven hills. Yeah, well... That's why we have more clues. So let's look at the clues listed in Revelation 17. Just in Revelation 17, there's more in 18. All right, but Revelation 17, the great whore, Mystery Babylon, she was arrayed or clothed in purple and scarlet, or that's purple and deep dark red, decked with gold, precious stones and pearls, having a cup in her hand full of her filthiness of her fornication or her idolatry, She's the mother of harlots and abominations. She was drunk with the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus. She's the great city on seven hills, which reigns or has reigned over the kings of the earth. Now, these are just, again, a few of the clues here, just in 17. Well, let's look at the scarlet and purple here. All right, the colors of the cardinals. There's, there's two ruling branches in the Roman Catholic Church, the color of the cardinals. They wear red. And the bishops, they wear purple. Now, there's people, again, the people that say, oh, it's the United States. Last time I checked, our colors are red, white, and blue, not red and purple, right? <laughs> I mean, you got to pay attention to the details. You don't get to make up your own interpretation. But here it is, right in your face, right? Cardinal Edward Cassidy, president of the Pope's Council on Unity in 2000. He's a cardinal. Look, he's got on the red and the purple. And actually, I discovered that the official, the, the original robes of the Pope were red and purple. All right. So uh, pretty accurate. Let's keep going. It says they were decked with jewels and pearls and precious stones was their covering, right? At right, here's a jewel-encrusted gold and silver triple tiara of Pope Pius IX, one of as many a dozen such tri-rango crowns or whatever in the Vatican treasury. Can you imagine what that's worth right there? Just one of those. But they're covered with these things, right? The golden cup of abomination. It says a gold cup in her hand, right? Isn't that what it says? Yeah, it says here in, in Revelation 4, I mean 17, verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abomination. 500 diamonds encrust this golden chalice, a gift from Sultan Abdul Medij for Pope Pius IX's election, the first used by Pius IX on December 8, 1854, at the mass proclaiming the Immaculate Conception of Mary. I mean, first of all, what Pope would take a gift from a Muslim who denies Christ and use that as his holy chalice to do his mass and then takes this mass and declares, we're going to worship Mary. Pope John Paul, dressed in purple, holds a golden cup during a papal apology on March 12, 2000. Some cardinals in attendance were both prophetic colors of purple and scarlet. So you see, it's pretty clear here. 
That left here is this is a statue in the Vatican. It's Fides, the Catholic faith, is a woman holding a cup. Her, that's, that's the imagery they want to give you. It's a woman holding a golden cup of the Mass, portrayed by Lorenzo Sabatini and his, uh, and his assistants from 1573 to 1576 on the vault of the first floor, whatever that is, Sala de Falcone or whatever, uh, the Vatican. So, I mean, even they say here, here, the symbol of the Catholic faith is a woman holding a golden cup. <laughs> I mean, you can't make this stuff up, man. They admit who they are. All right, now here's some stuff. The Roman Catholic Church calls herself also the universal mother. Remember, it says she's the mother of the harlots and abominations. So Pope Gregory VII's letter to the Bishop of Mertz, or Metz, that is, 1081, he says, The Holy Fathers as well in general councils as in their writings and doings have called the Holy Roman Church the universal mother. <laughs> The universal mother, right? Another one down here says, I acknowledge the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Roman Church as the mother and teacher of all churches. So she claims to be the mother. Well, that's pretty clear, don't you think? There's more about the mystery. It talks about the mystery of the relationship with Mary. Now, this is a quote of John Paul II from the Vatican Information Service press release dated September 17th, 1997. He th says, thanks to greater attention to the mystery of the church and Mary's relationship with her, the Virgin has begun to be invoked more frequently as mother of the church. So you see it continues on with this mystery and mother and Babylon within their own writings. Of course, here's some things where they worship Mary, and this gets into the cup of their idolatry and the religion of their idolatry. I mean, this is a, a Regina of Regina. This is a prayer that they sing, kind of like a, in addition to the Hail Mary. And uh, this one says, Hail, O Queen of Heaven. Welcome, O Queen of Heaven. Welcome, O Lady of Angels. Hail, Thou Root. Hail, Thou Gate. I mean, they're calling her the Root and the Gate. These are terms for Jesus. Um, and the word hail, I mean, is a form of worship. And then it says, rejoice, O glorious virgin. But I got news for her. She had children with Joseph after Jesus was born. So Mary ceased to be a virgin, everybody. Shocker, right? Mary ceased to be a virgin. So she's not the perpetual virgin. You know what that comes from? That is a Roman god. I think it was Juniper or one of them, I, can't, I may have the name wrong, but there was a Roman goddess who was a perpetual virgin. Not Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was not a perpetual virgin. But look what it says. Rejoice, O glorious virgin, lovely beyond all others. Whoa, 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 whoa. Er, lovely above all others? Above Jesus? You see how they do this? They get people singing these songs, saying these prayers, and they're declaring she is above Jesus. This is what's dangerous. It says, grant unto us, uh, well, look, allow me to praise thee, O sacred virgin. Against thy enemies give me strength. This is idolatry. This is giving praise and worship and prayers to someone who was just a human being. And then, and actually who died and has not been resurrected yet. So this is unbelievable. It gets worse. Grant unto us, O merciful God, defense against our weaknesses, that we who remember the Holy Mother of God by the help of her intercession may rise from our iniquities. You're going to overcome your iniquities, rise from your iniquities through remembering Mary? No. The Bible tells us it's faith in the blood of Jesus. It's faith in his atoning death, his resurrection, who he is. That's how you rise from your iniquity. Mary has nothing to do with it. After giving birth to Jesus, she, was a, she, she chose, she willfully submitted to God to be a vessel for Jesus, God, to take on a human body. After that, that was it. She was just a human being used as a vessel. Just like me or you can be used as a vessel for God. It doesn't mean somehow that we all of a sudden become 
a god ourselves or goddess ourselves. But this is, look, I pulled this straight from EWTN.com. Here, here's, the, here's the URL. Now, it, you may have to, it may change because I did this years ago. But what I'm saying is you can still find it. It's still on there. The URL may not be the same. But if you go to EWTN.com, which is the Roman Catholic Cable Network, and you go to their teachings on Mary, you will find these. Here's another one, Regina Colley. This is just another, just to show you some of the crazy, calling her Queen of Heaven. It says here, Let us pray, O God, who gave joy to the world through the resurrection of thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Grant, we beseech thee, that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary, his mother, that we may obtain the joys of everlasting life. What? Queen of Heaven, that through her intercession, we may obtain everlasting life. Nope. We get everlasting life through Jesus, and he is the one who ever lives to make intercession for us. He's the high priest. Mary has nothing to do with that. This is pure heresy, false teaching, and it's idolatry. And again, remember, the cup is full of her what? Abomination, her fornication, or her idolatry. And there's more. Here's another one. This is Sal Virginia. Goes on to say, Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, our hope, our life. Didn't Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? For a Christian, Jesus is your life. He has said, I am the resurrection and the life. He told him in John 11. What the heck is this? She marries our life? <laughs> oh, to thee, he goes on to say, we send up our sighs, mourning, weeping in the valley of tears. Then it says to her, most gracious advocate. Whoa! Jesus is our advocate, not Mary. And it goes on to say, by her loving intercession, we be delivered from the present evils and from lasting death. This is just total blasphemy and heresy to add someone in to the saving process of Scripture and of what Jesus has done. This is such blasphemy. We are commanded clearly in Exodus, the Ten Commandments, you're not to make any graven images of anything that is on heaven and earth, specifically to bow down yourself to it. You hear that? I mean, he's very specific. Don't make any image to bow down to, right? Now, granted, I think there's some images we shouldn't even have, much less we shouldn't be bowing down to any physical object, all right? Here you have pope after pope with a statue of their false god, Virgin Mary, that's really an old Roman deity. Yeah, Ishtar... What's the other one from Babylon? Semiramis. Semiramis and so on down the line. But here, I mean, look, he's got his hands raised to her. He's kneeling. Pope John Paul II bowing. They're bowing their heads in front of this picture. This, the Roman Catholic Church, is and has always been full of idolatry. If this is not the definition of idolatry, then idolatry doesn't exist. You understand? <laughs> if this is not idolatry, then what is it? Somebody please tell me. Now, idolatry is spelled out in Colossians. It's, I mean, in uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and 6. It's spelled out in Romans. I mean, in Revelation and in Rome and in um, Galatians 5. As sins unto death. Meaning, if you are an idolater, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. In fact, in, in 1 Corinthians 5, we may turn there in a minute, it says, if anyone's called a brother, be an idolater, you're not even supposed to eat with them. I mean, this means we should have, we, if, if a person has been warned, that's in the Roman Catholic, they call themselves a Christian brother or sister, and they continue this idolatry, it says you're not even supposed to sit down and eat with them. Think about that. That's 1 Corinthians 5. Because idolatry is such a serious sin, we have to call them out of the idolatry. In fact, why don't we just turn there? We'll come back to the PowerPoint in just a second. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, just so you can see. Perhaps 
1 Corinthians 5, verse 9. Sure, if you want to. I mean, if it's not too trouble to switch back and forth, I don't know. If it is, don't worry about it. I think it's important for everybody to see this because we have a lot of ministries out there that seem no problem joining up and doing things with Roman Catholic priests and churches and ministries. And No, you don't. You have nothing to do with them. You'll never see me joining up with a Roman Catholic church or priest to do anything. I don't care if it's to go out and protest abortion. I might go on my own side of the street. You understand? I mean, what was funny one time while Kevin's putting this up, I was preaching on Auburn University campus. I was open air preaching with some guys. And we had a big group around. And then one guy was preaching. And I kind of broke off over here because somebody, a Christian, came up and asked me about once saved, always saved. So I started explaining that to him. Before I knew it, I had about 20 or 30 Christian students around me asking about the eternal security issue. So I'm just giving it to them. I'm giving it to them straight, going through the scriptures. About 15 minutes into this, I feel somebody standing beside me. And I'm like, I finally look over. Who is this standing right next to me? It's a Roman Catholic priest in his full black you know, suit with the dog collar. And I'm like, and he was agreeing with me. And I'm like, oh. I looked at him and I'm like, really? <laughs> just, what are you doing? You know, I mean, he just sidled up next to me like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, what? These guys, man, there's something else. Uh, <laughs> uh, five, uh, nine. Let's look at this. Paul said, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet not all together with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with the idolaters for then uh, must need ye go out of the world. So he's saying here, I wrote to you an epistle. You're not to keep company with fornicators. And then he says, well, I'm not talking about, you know, people in the world because you got to go out to people in the world and be a light and a witness. But then he clarifies it. He says, verse 11, he said, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man is called a, a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. And he goes on to say they need to be put out of the church. So anyone claims to be a brother, a sister in Christ, yet they are bowing down to statues praying to the statues, thinking there's power in the statue, kissing a statue like they kiss a statue of St. Peter's feet at the Vatican. This is idolatry. It is not to be tolerated. We should care enough to tell them the truth. I tell Catholics the truth about it. I don't care if they get mad at me. We've had Catholics sitting in here, and I know they're Catholics. And I will tell them exactly this. Because I, but not because I'm trying to be mean, I want them to be saved. And to be saved, they're going to have to leave the idolatry. Because this is a sin. God says, this will separate you from me forever. And if you don't uh, doubt that, could we, are we still set up for Scripture? All right, go to Galatians 5. Just so we lay the foundation of this. And then we're going to do one more. We'll go to Revelation 21 after this. Um. But Galatians 5, you know, because a lot of times we get focused, we get focused on stuff like witchcraft or we get focused on adultery or homosexuality or fornication, you know, sexual immorality, drunkenness, drugs. But we forget that God said idolatry is in the same list. It's in the same list with murder. Okay, that's how serious it is to God. Here in Galatians 5, verse 19, Paul writes, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest or revealed. Which are these? Adultery. He says, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. Verse 20 there, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like of the which I tell you before. As I have also told you in times past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The word do 
is a present tense Greek verb, meaning those who practice habitually, ongoing. So not only is it a present tense Greek verb, but guess what? The word do right there, you know what the word do, the definition is? And you need to know this. Prasso, P-R-A-S-S-O, prasso. You know what it means? Practice habitually. So the one who is a practicing habitual adulterer or murderer or idolater will not inherit the kingdom of God, period. All right, so let's, let's go to Revelation. Let's see if, because if, some people say, well, that just means they miss out on the, the blessings of the kingdom, but that doesn't mean they're not saved. Let's go to Revelation and see, Revelation 21. Remember, let put it all together. All the pieces go together. That's how you make doctrine. Here it is. Revelation 21. 6 through 8. Jesus speaking here. He said unto me, I, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It is not a joke. It is not a game. God says so serious if one calls himself the brother and they're worshiping Mary, if they're bowing to statues. I mean, and this goes for the Christians too. They've got the little statues of little fat Buddha in their house. They got the little fat Buddha sitting up on the kitchen counter. Little, little happy Buddha. What are you doing with that in your house? What was it... Uh, Garrett Crawford, in one of his songs, he says something about, he said, you, you say you love Jesus, and you, but you, you're worshiping Buddha, you're nothing but a Judas. <laughs> I mean, I love, I love Garrett's lyrics. He, he's got some good stuff. All right, let's go back to where we were. Idolatry serious. Rome is full of idolatry. The Roman Catholic Church, all of its practices from the mass listen from the mass it, look, look here you want to show you another way not just the mary worship not just praying to dead saints and, and, and angels but but look here let me see i don't even know what i have pictured next but there's more mary look at them on their knees before statues of mary and and before statues of the pope they get the little kids out here on their knees bowing to a statue of the pope and we can go back all the way. This is in the 1960s or 50s right there. Worshiping Mary. But let me show you this. Let's, let me, let's just use my phone for a minute. When a priest says he can do his hocus pocus Latin, they can turn a piece of bread into the literal body of Jesus. Now what they'll say about that is, you say, well, that's crazy enough in itself. And Jesus even said, the words I speak unto you, the spirit and life. He wasn't talking about it being literal because the people thought that it was being literal in John 6. He says, I'm not talking about being literal. But the Roman Catholic Church says, no, our priest and only our priest, we can turn this, in, this little piece of bread into the literal body of Jesus. But let me tell you what they'll do. They got a little thing up in front of the church called a tabernacle. And they'll, in there, and they'll take that little piece of bread once they've done their hocus pocus and they'll put it in that little tabernacle and they'll have people come up and kneel and bow before that as, as if it is Jesus Christ. Now, in Matthew 24, Jesus said, If anybody says to you, Lo, here is Christ, or here, here is Christ, believe it not. No. Uh-uh. So, there's idolatry with Mary. There's idolatry with saints. There's idolatry with angels. There's idolatry with icons or paintings and statues but there's idolatry with the wafer with the eucharist as they call it and even the wine of the cup 
So here, let's go back to our thing here. So it says that the world is drunk or influenced by the wine of her fornication, her idolatry. And look at this. March 21st, 2005, cover of Time Magazine. Catholics have long revered her, but now Protestants are finding their own reasons to celebrate the mother of Jesus. Why? Why do we need to do that? I, you know, I, again, there's no point in it, but here, you know, Protestants aren't far behind. Now, the persecution, and I want to talk a little bit about the Jesuits. We, we move into the 1500s, and of course, you saw in the video that we watched a minute ago how, I mean, you're talking about for centuries, the Roman Catholic Church persecuted true Christians, all right, for centuries upon centuries, killed millions, all right? And not just killed, but we, we're talking about torturous, horrible, horrific ways. Yeah, it's so terrible. And when it seemed as if the Church of Rome were mined and crushed by the Reformation, the Order of the Jesuits was formed, the most powerful and cruel of all the orders within the papacy. It undertook, first of all, to capture colleges and universities, then to climb to power in the state. It succeeded in dominating certain nations and in persecuting with unspeakable cruelty that Protestantism uh, which it was invented to destroy. So the entire reason that Ignatius Loyola formed the Jesuits, begged the Pope to let him form the Jesuit, a former military general who was severely wounded and, and for many, many, many months was trying to recover from his wounds and had this uh, revelation, I believe, from the demonic realm that he just, he begged the Pope to let him form an order to crush Protestant Christianity that had removed itself from the heresies of Rome and the idolatry of Rome. So in the 1500s, this began, the, what's called the Counter-Reformation. Right? Now, um, this is the Jesuit oath that was made public in a con congressional hearing many, many years ago. All right, let's just read this, the, the Jesuit oath. I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity present, make and wage relentless war secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and the wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poniard, and the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be the condi their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do so by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. So what you saw in the video of church history there of the, has continued. The Jesuits continue this. They continue infiltration. They continue disinformation campaigns. They continue to try to influence and take over uh, nations and governments. Uh, most of the bloodbaths that we've seen has either been instigated by the Jesuits or by Muslims in the days. That, now, I could, I, I could get into this, and I may, but um, here's Samuel Morse, the man that created the Morse Code. This is what he said. Of him. He said, the Jesuits are a secret society, a sort of Masonic order with a super added features of revolting odiousness and a thousand times more dangerous. Hitler, remember you saw Hitler in there. It's well known, you know, it's well known that Hitler said, and I, I'm, I hate that the quote is not, was not in that video, and I don't have it, but it's in the Chick um, publications from Alberto that he, you know, the Vatican <laughs> Jesuit that got saved and left the, the Vatican that admitted all the things that they were doing. They pretty well stated that Hitler said that what he was doing in the Holocaust, he said he was just continuing the work of the Roman Catholic Church. Flat out. 
I mean, he, he said that. And we know that his people met with the Vatican and they were working together. And what I was going to get at a minute ago, it's also a pretty well-known fact now that the Roman Catholic Church are the ones that trained and got Muhammad started and created Islam. All right? So when you think about talking about the mother of abominations of the earth, if it is true, and I believe it is, that the Roman Catholic Church also helped create Islam, and which it is, think about all the bloodshed of Christians that have suffered since Islam began, under Islam. So what happened was the Roman Catholic Church figured out a way to create an entity that would carry on their work of trying to stamp out Christianity so the blame could be put on the Muslims and not on the Catholic Church. Yeah, it has backfired. But of course, Muhammad did kind of rebel and create his own version. Uh, he was being trained by a priest. His first wife was Roman Catholic. That's why in the Quran there's a book uh, of Mary. <laughs> I mean, you think about how Muslims treat women and look at women, and yet in the Quran there's a book for a woman named Mary, but not a book for you know any of Muhammad's wives that he had, but yet there's one for Mary. So, But here Hitler made this statement here. I have learned most of all from the Jesuit order. So far, there has been nothing more imposing on earth than the hierarchical organization of the Catholic Church. A good part of that organization have I transported direct to my own party. That is a direct quote from Mr. Adolf Hitler, taken from uh, Edmund Paris's book, The Vatican Against Europe, and Hermann Roshing, former National Socialist Chief of the Government of Danzig, Hitler, so on and so forth. Paris, pages, uh, Paris, 1939. So, some pretty wild stuff. Of course, the Jesuits, I believe the ones that killed Abraham Lincoln, that it was a plot. Charles Chinicky, who was a Roman Catholic priest who left the Roman Catholicism after he wrote the book 50 Years in the Church of Rome, became a very powerful Protestant leader uh, in the 1800s, became close friends with uh, President Lincoln. President Lincoln asked him to become a spy in the Vatican for him, but he denied, he, he did not accept that because he said, I can't leave my flock because he was leading people out of Roman Catholicism and had a church. Uh, he said, after 20 years of constant and most difficult research, I come fearlessly today before the American people to say and to prove that the president, Abraham Lincoln, was assassinated by the priests and the Jesuits of Rome. And he laid it out. And actually, Pastor Chiniki, friends of Abraham Lincoln, warned him to beef up his security, his personal security, before his assassination, and he didn't listen to him. Here is the guy I was talking about, Alberto Rivera. His story is amazing. This is why I wanted you to get the Alberto series from Jack Chick, because his story is amazing. I heard him many, many years ago. He came out with his credentials, as you can see. Uh, this is in the, I believe he came out in the late, yeah, in the late 60s. He was a Jesuit. He was trained in the Vatican. He spent much time in the Vatican archives. He found out his sister was a nun. He found out how badly they were treating her. He went to try to rescue her, and the whole fiasco made him say, I, I, I have to leave this. And it was just, it's a tremendous story and testimony. And this man lived on uh, for many years, several decades after he converted and preached in churches and you can still find videos of him preaching and teaching he was you know there's no way he was a continued to be a jesuit he was a truly converted born again christian and i believe they finally uh poisoned him that's how they killed him i believe but uh anyway he he has a lot of good information there's more of his uh, id stuff his id card from the spanish government in 1967 under the rule of the Spanish dictator Franco, his security forces would equally be were equally strict as the Gestapo had been in Germany. 
And so to obtain this document, Alberto had to supply birth certificate, identification papers, and proof positive from his archdiocese of being a priest. So again, Alberto could not have possibly forged this document. Security was very strict. But again, his life for decades after that proved that he had been converted, truly converted to Christianity. So let's go back. Let's go back to, and I think that's my last slide on that. So let's go back to Revelation, and we'll close out quickly because we didn't even get to chapter 18, but I want to show you another another clue here and address one um, argument that some of our detractors that want to say America's Babylon try to pull out. All right, but let's read. Let's go to Revelation 1, I mean, Revelation 18, verse 1. And let's read this here. He says, And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having a great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her, even as she hath rewarded you, double Double unto her according to her works, in the cup that she has filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she said in her heart, I sit a queen, I am no widow, I shall see no sorrow. Now, I want to stop right there real quick and just get this. She says, I sit a queen, and I am no widow. The word in the Greek is basilica, all right? Well, guess where the word comes from? It comes from a Latin word, basilica. So literally what this is saying here is, I sit a basilica. A basilica was a Roman building of government building. So it's literally saying here, I sit a Roman government building called a basilica. St. Peter's Basilica is what it's called, the Vatican. All right? I sit a basilica. I am no widow. And look at that, I shall see no sorrow. And, and in her head, she believes she's going to take over and control the entire earth. But God has other plans for her. But think about that. I sit a queen. What is a queen? A woman in authority with a crown. Right? It's meant she's that mother. She's a mother, all right. Let's keep going. It says in verse 8, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall wail and lament, uh, lament rather, for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. For no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, and all thine and, and wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of precious wood and of brass, iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beast and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and the souls of men. I, mean, I could take some time, but I want to, I want to say this. Just when you, people point out, one of the main arguments that the United States is Mystery Babylon is that we're allegedly the wealthiest nation on the earth. And so because we're so wealthy and we have such economic influence, it's got to be us. Here's the problem with that. Um, a woman named Karen Hughes came out not too long ago. She had worked for the World Bank and she became a whistleblower. And you know what she did? This woman told the truth. She's not a Christian. She's not a Catholic. 
But she just told the truth. And here's what she said. First of all, our, our country, what are we, $20 trillion in debt now? How is a country $20 trillion in debt, the wealthiest country on the face of the earth? We're not, all right? Pretty much, also, we don't produce much of anything that we export, except for oil. And we're, you know, we could produce a lot of that in export. We're not the leading export in, let's just pick one, marble. Let me tell you who the leading exporter of marble is. Take any guess? Italy, exactly. We're not the leading exporter in olive oil. Guess who is? Italy. We aren't the leading exporter in fine flour. Guess who is? Italy. Italy. <laughs> um, you're getting my drift here. Now, this Karen Hoods came out, and that's just me doing a little research. I didn't even get to look up everything, right? But just, she admitted, she said, let me, let me just tell you, you want to know where the income of the United States, the money that's actually the wealth of the United States, she said 60% of it, how does she put it? 60% goes to the Illuminati families. No, 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 I'm sorry. Let's rewind that. 60% goes to the Jesuits, the Vatican. The other 40% goes to the Illuminati, the, the 13 families. Well, that's 100%. So where's our money come from? Well, she pointed out two things. That's why our government got into the drug trade starting in Vietnam, now Afghanistan, shipping it from South and Central America. That's why the DEA runs the drug, the drug money, because that's how they fund everything. That's why Bush was running drugs. That's why Clinton was running drugs. This is, these are just the facts of it, right? Now, nobody wants to talk about it. Plus, the Federal Reserve can just print money. It doesn't have to have anything to back it with, just print more. <laughs> so, which is why everything's going to collapse eventually. We will have, the United States will have a financial collapse. Plus, again, their big argument, the United States is the wealthiest country in the world, so they got to be Mystery Babylon. No. No, no, no. The Vatican has been pillaging land and property and priceless artifacts from countries and nations and individuals for centuries. And they have it stored, most of it, under the Vatican. But think about if you just took the prime property that they own throughout the world and the ancient buildings and art that they own and the fact that they can have a banking scandal where billions of dollars disappears and it, that it's not even a blip on their screen. No, the Vatican is the wealthiest entity on the face of the earth. That is a fact, not the United States. All right, so let's just dispel this whole <laughs> fantasy. Also, let's dispel another fantasy. There's a fantasy being taught that, that the United States is Mystery Babylon and that we will be destroyed and, and that in that one hour where it's going to be a, a, you know, a nuclear holocaust, we're going to be destroyed to start the tribulation period. Well, newsflash, and I, I'm not going to develop this today. I'm just going to tell you. But Mystery Babylon is destroyed not at the beginning of the tribulation period, but at the very end, at the seventh vial of wrath is when she is destroyed. She rides the beast all the way to the end. This is what the Bible teaches. So again, just because it sounds, something might sound plausible or might have a possibility does not mean it's biblical. And I believe that the Jesuits and the Catholics have created like these things like preterism, like a historical allegorical views of revelation. And they have created all this disinformation so that people will not look at them as a big, big, big part of the problem. You know, um, anyway, this, you, you can't get away from this as church history. And 
John said, not only will they be here, now he said, not only are they here now, but they're going to be here until the words of God are fulfilled. Now, I'm going to finish this toward the end of this chapter. I want, to, I want you to see this, because this is, confirms again that it's Rome, that it's the Vatican. There's mystery Babylon. And they were saying, alas, alas, that great city, not great nation, but that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour, so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust upon their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all they that had ships by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she is made desolate. Now look at, listen to verse 20. So she's destroyed quickly. And I do believe in nuclear weapons. I'm not into that conspiracy theory. I do believe nuclear weapons are real and they exist. It says, Rejoice over her, thou holy uh, thou heaven and holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. No craftsman of whatsoever craft he be, shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall, uh, shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom, which is Jesus, and the voice of the bride, church, shall no more at all be in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, and for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Now look at verse 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints. And listen to this and all that were slain upon the earth. Think about that for a minute. But he says to the holy apostles in heaven and the prophets, verse 20, God's avenged you. See? She has to have the blood of Peter and Paul and pretty much all of Christianity on her hand. And you think... Like I said, there's proof she created Islam. There's also proof she created communism and Nazism. So you think of all the bloodshed and death, Nazism, communism, Islam, and the Roman Catholic Church being the mother of all that. Don't tell me there's not an eternal hell, folks. You think you can torture millions and millions of people and kill them, and you're just going to be annihilated and escape? New Siri Bob. Not going to happen. There is an eternal suffering and torment and punishment coming for such wickedness. And a lot of those popes have been in there for centuries cooking as they so deserve. All right, folks, we need to sh close it down today. Hope y'all learned something. Probably some stuff you already knew, but let me tell you, it's good to get refreshed on it. Um, popular doctrines are not always true doctrines. We've got to go back to the scriptures, go back to history. Um, I love, I'm going to give you a, a, a quote. Here's a quote from Leonard Ravenhill, man of God, from his book, Why Revival Tarries, from 1959. He's speaking of the Roman Catholic Church. He said, the greatest forgery that Lucifer ever made. And I'm going to tell you, he wasn't shy. He wrote all about the evil of the Roman Catholic Church in his book, Why Revival Tarries. And that man wrote some classic. I don't think I've required you to read any of them, but if you want to read some good books, pick you up a Leonard Ravenhill book, Why Revival Tarries. He's got another one called, listen to this one, Sodom had no Bible. That title alone ought to make you tremble because you got a Bible, right? <laughs> All right. So anyway, y'all have a great weekend. This was history class five, the Roman Catholic Church. All right.
We're done today. God bless you guys. Class dismissed.